So, hi, Larry. How's it going? I'm okay. Today's a, a fairly good day. Um, are you in California? I am. We are. And I feel very grateful to be here at, at this moment when so much of the country is uh, dealing with horrendous uh, natural um, disasters. Um, yeah, truly. So, can't complain. Good. Even though I'm known to complain, actually. But, <laughs> Um, uh, I think we're luckier than most people in the world at this, at this time, this, at yeah. this really confusing time. So, you know, no gigs, no gigs. That's, that's the bummer, you know, no, yeah. no place to play live. Um, so that, you know, that gets me down. So, you know, some days I'm truly like, um, a little bit, <laughs> Uh, down about just a big question mark over, I think, all um, artists, all performing mm -hmm. artists in terms of our futures, you know, how it's all going to work and when it's going to work, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a very stressful unknown to have. So having said that, I have this little studio in the backyard of our home and I'm able to do some work for, you know, from here. Mm -hmm. And I do this Patreon thing, um, mm -hmm. and that's keeps building, and that's good because that's a that's a that's a means of, it's it's a way to teach, which I like to do, and it's a way to um, come up with creative ways of of teaching, and um, and connecting, and mm -hmm. what we need now is connection, you know, so it's like I have this little private group that's expanding little by little of fans um, mm -hmm. who interact with me and um, it's fun for me too. It gets me thinking about music. It gets me thinking, it gets my wheels turning about video, little videos I can make for them, educational things. That's been fun too, because I think the pandemic is like um, the lockdowns um, and the not traveling. I, I haven't not traveled for this long a stretch since I started traveling for a living, you know? So really half my year is travel. So it's like a kind of a morning <laughs> that I yeah. feel a lot of the time. And like, you see all these people putting up old gigs, old gigs a year <laughs> ago, you know, uh, or more. And I've started to put pictures up of, cause I think a lot of people are going through their photos. I think a lot more these days. Um, and I'm putting pictures up of like all my heroes of mostly people who were mentors of me, mm -hmm. you know, like Arnie Lawrence who's the, per who's the guy who started the new school. And like he really was the first person. And I'm really, it's, it's an opportunity to appreciate what, <laughs> what we all had, um, you know. Um, and, you know, Jim Hall used to say, um, I had the privilege of touring around with Jim Hall for two and a half years or so. And we'd be on some grueling, ridiculous tour. And uh, it'd be like the worst travel day. And we'd be sitting in an airport waiting for a, a flight that was late. And he'd say something like, you know, guys, it's still a privilege that we get to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And first of all, coming from Jim Hall, he was always one to just, I don't know, when he said something, I, you really wanted to listen. I think he had some incredible experience in his life and um and a sort of wisdom and um and it's it's like now it's like it's so true you know you can be in the midst of a tour that where you're just in survival survival mode getting from gig to gig and the two hours you're on stage that's the thing that that you that's really what it's about but some of these tours are grueling mm -hmm. and you start to complain and you know, moan about this life. And now it's gone, at least for now. And boy, I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd be very happy being on a, in a van somewhere in the middle of <laughs> Germany to play a cool venue where, and you know, we need to play for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been watching some of these live streams, some of which are great, but the thing that's never there is the feeling of a shared experience. Mm -hmm. Even though you get thumbs up and emojis and shit like that. Um, 
what you're seeing when you're seeing something live is uh, you're sharing the physical space, you know? Mm -hmm. And can you imagine music uh, d developing in a situation like this, you know, or anything? <laughs> right. You know, not really getting used to it. I mean, I'm less, uh, there's, a, there's less of a fear in a way than the early days because nobody knew anything and it was Trump and it was, everything was confusing and, um, but still, it's like, there's still all these big question marks, you know? So it's the question, how am I is, well, there, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, that reminded me of a lot, a lot of things. But one thing in particular was over the summer a lot, I would like always tune in to your Instagram lives like late at night. And those were so either like hilarious. Like I think once you played along with like Muzak recordings. And yes. That yeah. one was amazing. Or just taking requests and, you know, that was something that did really make me feel connected. And, and people, and I, a lot of joy. That. I really like hearing that. And people, other people did say that and, um, or wrote me separately and said, uh, you know, you helped me through the, <laughs> through the pandemic. Um, I was helping, trying to help myself. My God, I mean, I was, uh, you know, a lot of those I was probably drinking. And that was also helpful too. But you know what, in the interim, I'm learning all these skills about how to output correctly my sound and my video to the world, mm -hmm. which I think is a skill pandemic or post pandemic that is extremely useful because that's where all music has gone, it's gone to video and it's people expect a certain quality of audio. And the other thing I'm doing, I don't know if you follow me on Twitch, but I'm mm -hmm. now a Twitcher, um, which for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's it's not a nervous disease. It's a, um, a it's a platform just for streaming, and it started out for um, gamers. And if you've ever seen like gamers with the headset, and there's kids all over the world watching somebody play a video game, well, I guess in order to set that up effectively they got the sound and they got the video really good on Twitch. Eventually musicians started using it, especially the ones who had little home studios or little setups where they knew how to get through some of this technical stuff that I needed to get through with the help of, it wasn't really that hard. And actually the software is free. And anyway, it turns out it's kind of like, feels a little bit like a gig or, or it just feels like people are there because they're interested to watch you create. And that's gotten me to experiment with different things in this room, you know, that I wouldn't normally have the opportunity to do traveling around, mm -hmm. right? you know, where I get to my piano, I get to the piano or the organ that's at the gig. I mean, the fact is, if I'm only here half the year, there's a lot of this stuff I'm not really figuring out like, what would I do if this was my ax? You know, if I took out the celeste, I have this, I'm borrowing, it's not mine, but it's an old celeste from the turn of the century. And um, I've done some videos with that and it's just getting me to sort of try some, some other things. And it's almost like a throwback to when I had, I was lucky enough to be a kid that had a basement in the house that I grew up in. And that basement became my music room. And it's where I did all my experimenting, listening to records, bringing my friends down, you know, <laughs> never seeing the light of day. And um, I actually had an organ. I didn't know anything about Hammond organ, uh, but I had this Yamaha organ that, that my dad bought and um, I used to love organ stores, you know, like um, back in the day, that was like a, a, a thing that people had in their living rooms was some kind of organ mm -hmm. um, that had the, bass pedals and the foxtrot and the bossa nova and you can and I loved that I mm -hmm. loved and my mother would drop me off not that you asked but my mother would drop me off at this place on route not I grew up uh, in, in a suburb of Boston I grew up in Newton Mass and this place was like in Framingham and she would drop me off as if like we were really pretending that maybe we were interested in some eight thousand dollar three-tiered spaceship I just love sitting down at this thing or one of these things, Baldwin organ and piano. 
And uh, I remember John Kiley was there one day. He, John Kiley, you would not know his name. He was the organ player for Fenway Park for the Boston Red Sox. And one day he was there like signing autographs. He was this big red faced alcoholic looking dude. And he was the guy who you always heard at Fenway Park. And there he was. But I sat down on one of these organs and my mother would go off shopping somewhere and leave me there. And I have, you know, I think that was very influential thing mm -hmm. but i it was only years later when i started playing hammond organ that i remembered that like i didn't even make a connection between the two except obviously there's a connection between the two right but anyway i digest what's next yeah well it's funny like i i also had a little i saw my mom like when you said there was like an organ in your basement and that was your music room. I saw my yeah. mom react because that's like my situation too. We had like an M3 and I really? don't, still don't know how to play organ. I don't have any organ chops, but that was like similar for me. I think it's so great to have an instrument growing up when you're growing up in a home. And I, I didn't even mention the piano. It was right. my, a present to my, to my parents, I think, from my grandmother. And it was a small Steinway, uh, baby it was a baby grand mm -hmm. very small piano but it was a steinway it was from like the 70s it wasn't a incredibly valuable but it was a steinway still when it was in tune basically sounded like a steinway and so i was very lucky in that way and then i had a basement forget about it i mean yeah. that was my um this is now my basement this is now my my playroom as an adult mm -hmm. um so happy we got this thing it's actually a prefabricated thing once we ordered everything they they came and two weeks later the thing was up nice. it was kind of crazy and it's not soundproof but we don't really have people right on top of us so it's not really mm -hmm. an issue i mean if the if there's a lawnmower or something and i have to record audio and anyway it's not a problem it's amazing how many studios i've been in in los angeles professional ones where they deal with the same thing. And I, 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 when I realized that I didn't feel so bad, it's like, oh, you know what? Let's have lunch now because <laughs> you know, we're gonna hear this thing for an hour. And right. I didn't feel so bad. People are just, you know, people just trying to make do with what they have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very key to have, a, I think, a separate space. That's really good if you yeah. have a family and you know, then your, your kids are convinced that dad actually has some kind of job you know, <laughs> that he goes to over there yeah well speaking of like the Steinway you had you grew up playing classical piano at first right or I would say no I would I mean I the first teacher I had was a classical was it someone who was teaching me how to read and mm -hmm. some basic classical pieces but I didn't go far with that um except to say that um I've always listened to a lot of classical music. I love, my father uh, was a big classical fan, so he had cassettes in his car and I loved the Brahms that he had, you know, and so he was also always listening to classical radio. So that tweaked my interest because I loved harmony early on, things that had some kind of harmonic interest, like uh, Billy Joel was one of the first, you know, pop people that I would learn from, try to try to learn his songs on the piano. Because a lot of his songs are definitely coming out of the, that kind of bass movement and that kind of, um, you know, he loved classical music too. Mm -hmm. And um, and so little by little, I would hear something and then somebody came over to the house and taught me the blues scale. I remember that. And that was just like, Pew! and then gave me like a Dave McKenna record maybe. And Dave McKenna was a a great Boston-based, uh, New England-based uh, piano player um, who was world-renowned, but not like Shearing. And like Shearing, for instance, said that Dave McKenna was the best solo piano player. And I got to know him a little bit and get to, I mean, I got to see him. I didn't really know him, but um, I got to see him play. And he was a guy, uh, another, speaking of bass lines in uh, Oregon, he was a guy who played mostly excelled at um, solo piano. Mm -hmm. And his, t his thing on, on solo piano was to play bass lines. That was the thing. And he played a mean bass line. It didn't sound corny. It was strong and it swung. And I, th and I thought, oh, that's how you play solo piano. You know, mm -hmm. 
So maybe there's a connection between that and also getting to, into organ later because I liked playing bass lines. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the classical thing was really um, more by osmosis. Like I go to, just like I go to Brazilian music or anything that's got harmonic or melodic interest to me, I go to classical music when I hear like, okay, that's something I need to steal. Right. That he did something there that's crazy. You know, just the way that I would hear Herbie Hancock do something, I'm gonna go, I need to find out what that is, analyze it, figure, you know, how do I apply that? How do I use that? Because I don't have that in my vocabulary. The same things with, uh, and I always encourage students, the same thing. That's, I mean, if you talk to anybody like Herbie or the late chick um, or Keith, I mean, those guys knows tons about the classical repertoire. Mm -hmm. Even like the beboppers. I mean, when I was at the new school, which is where I went uh, right after high school, it was a brand new program when I it was, I was in the first graduating class actually. And it was 1986. It was 1986. <laughs> um, and I walk into a class and Donald Bird is teaching this class. And he goes, all right. And he's listening to something on his walk command. Um, so a few people might not know what that, what that means, but anyway, he's listening to his Walkman. He says, all right, come here. And he gives me one of his ears and then he keeps one of his ears on and it's this beautiful flute music. And it's the Jacques Ebert flute concerto. I know that now because I instantly went to tower records and found a performance that was great and, and, and figured out that I looked that Jockey Bear was a guy that I didn't know about. And, and oh, you should check check out his one and only, I think it's just this one flute concerto he did. Beautiful. Then on another day, Jimmy Heath had the score to the Ravel string quartet. It's only one of those, which I hadn't heard. And he was studying it again, he said, because he was he had been commissioned to uh, write a, 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 an arrangement of Naima, if I remember correctly, for the um, Kronos Quartet, and he was going over his his Ravel, you know, and I was like, God, these guys know their shit. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a lot to be gained from um, from having been around people like that to tell to tell us like this stuff's important too, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, tech from a technical point of view, um, I don't have much training. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, whatever I know about sound and technique is me just with bad fingering, trying to, cause that's what, that's what happened when I, I got really lazy with the classical lessons. Um, I remember I got easily frustrated with Bach because it wasn't at all natural to me how to finger things mm -hmm. and so i you know to 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 play the piece and then to remember fingering so you don't run out of fingers i, I realized that required a lot of practice yep and for that reason i said no 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 not for me i'm not a practicer um no but i sort of so i sort of and then I found jazz and then I went to this music camp when I was 12 mm -hmm. and I really realized that that's what I could do that more naturally was improvise, hear things. My parents, I remember when I was still taking classical lessons, I would fool them they, in, into thinking I was still playing Mozart, but really I was just trying to improvise in, in the style. I'm sure it sucked. <laughs> it was really bad but they were like wow he's practicing his Mozart I'm like yeah, <laughs> I do remember that but anyway that's uh, that's the extent and to this day I, I'm still trying to discover what I don't know about the classical repertoire mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important and it keeps feeding inspirational thoughts to mm -hmm. me well one thing I wanted to ask you about was maybe getting more into composition land, like you have written and performed with so many like diverse people in different genres and also for film and TV. I'm curious if you could talk about your compositional approach and maybe how it changes situationally 
whether it's like you're writing a tune or if you have to do something for a TV show, like how does it begin and how, how does it differ between those projects? Well, you know, when I used to, when I used to just write, just to write, you know, when I was um, in school or for instance, um, or, and especially when I, when I had at least something to write for, like my trio. Um, well, that, so there's an example where you're, you're thinking about specific people, right. you know, especially once, once we got going and once we sort of started to figure out what we did well and then that's easy because you can visualize. So back in the day when it was just a piano and no laptop and stuff, you know, I remember this one tune I wrote. The, the, it, um, so, so in terms of songwriting and, and, and that kind of thing, that's that's a whole that can, that's a whole conversation itself because there's right. different ways that we get to a, a, an idea. I remember this tune, the Acrobat, came to me when I was walking through. Um, Washington Square Park and I could just kind of see it it was sort of mathematical there was there's a cycle in there and I was trying to figure out oh how many steps will it take me when I play this melody it's going to take how many steps to get to, to where I want to land and so I was sort of working the progression out uh, mathematically and I was like I'm not you know there's one chord I wasn't sure how it was going to sound but it seemed to make sense from a voice leading point of view in my brain and then I got home and I was right so so, so but re very rarely do I write songs like that without an instrument but there is something to be said about uh having your ears develop to a degree where you can write in your head mm -hmm. so you're not constricted by the instrument um for the same reason I love nowadays and for many years with synths even before like uh, Pro Tools and whatever. Um, I loved to, to write on other sounds like sampled sounds mm -hmm. because then that gets me to, it's the same with any instrument. Um, if you get to a piano that stinks, but it has the upper register got this thing that, you know, you wanna take advantage of the strengths of an instrument, I think mm -hmm. in order to sound your best. Um, that's what I do anyway. Um, like on a real bulky piano that's that's um, got a tough action, that bothers me <laughs> because that brings out the fact that I don't have like Russian um, like gravity training. You know, uh -huh. to to me, that's when I notice my my weakness in terms of sound production. But what I'm gonna say. Uh, about that is that in that case I will instead of struggling I'll play slower <laughs> you know or I'll play more chordal that night or something mm -hmm. I'll never forget Lee Konitz said something to me at a festival we were hanging out in this hotel room and he said he just wasn't feeling good uh, before the set so he decided to just kind of um, change what his goal was you know for the gig he's like he just said you know i'm i think i can still play pretty melodies and play them nice mm -hmm. so i'm not going to really try to do much more than that you know and he sort of set his and then it was a good night because he was able to do that you know i was like wow that takes some courage for one thing you know i mean it's like that was the first thing i was like i could never do that you know because you go to a gig with all these preconceptions of what you just expect that people expect certain things of you, you know, and uh, and that that does happen. But as soon as you let that go, it's kind of cool. I'm not that good at it, but I've you know when I see Lee Konitz say something like that, or um, you know, I no, I mean I have found just out of survival that I have to play an instrument. To, you know, I have to figure out, and it's the same with the sample. So if you've got a really nice, I don't know, guitar sample, I love guitar samples, especially acoustic guitar samples. Mm -hmm. I don't play guitar, but I, I mess around on it and I know 
I've known, I've been around enough guitar players to know how it works, what its limitations are and things like that. So you have to play within those limitations. Otherwise, the, the really good sample will not sound that good because even to the amateur, it'll be like, oh, it sounds like, you know. So that's a challenge in itself. So that gets you to write in a different way, you know, mm -hmm. within those challenges, within those limitations rather. Mm -hmm. So that's another way I write uh, from just writing songs. Then there's writing with uh, singers or lyricists because I'm not a lyricist. Um, and that's great too. That's a whole other thing. That's, um, I had never been collaborative in my writing process until Curtis Steigers called me. I don't know if you're familiar with Curtis Steigers um, back in the nineties. And he had been a pop artist who had some big hits but had his roots in jazz. Then he kind of had a bad experience finally uh, um, in that world and decided to, and, and got signed by Concord as a jazz artist. So mm -hmm. ever since then, he's been a, um, a very good jazz, uh, jazz singer. And um, the first person to really think of me as a writer, you know, cause he was a, he was a fan of some of my songs mm -hmm. at my trio. And he would call, he called me and said, hey, I would love to write a lyric to this song. And that was the first time somebody ever had uh, said that to me. And I was extremely psyched because I always, like I'll sing into my phone. It's always as if there's a fake lyric there. Not always, but, but frequently. Mm -hmm. And so I frequently think, boy, this, I wish this had a lyric on it, you know? And then I start, so I started to meet more people who did that. You know, in Curtis's case, he was some, someone who did that and was an excellent, you know, uh, singer. Mm -hmm. So, and then he was signed to a record label and started to re record those songs, you know, with me. So that was, that was a wonderful introduction to, and it continues to that kind of writing where you're collaborating with somebody and you're also in some cases having to make some changes and to be flexible because he's got this lyric idea and you know and vice versa vice versa i always say that i always say vice versa i do that yeah my, and, and my daughter always goes it's vice versa dad but anyway then um let's see uh yes yeah, so movie i haven't done a lot of um i've played on many more films and television things that I've uh, that obviously that I I mean that I have uh, written uh, mm -hmm. for but that uh, has been a very very um, very good but challenging process first of all I always I am a big film lover so and comedy you know so um, I always kind of wanted to do that I always loved John Williams anybody who disses John Williams is is in trouble because mm -hmm. um, I, I really did appreciate how good his music was, you know, especially at, then after hear, you know, hearing lesser people like score those type of big movies. And I always, I knew he was a jazz guy originally and that always interested me, you know, he had made records as Johnny Williams and uh, started as a jazz person. Um, but anyway, I have obviously never been on something of that size. The first real film I did, well, I did documentary for a guy who paid me very little and said, look, at least your name's gonna be on it and there'll be a foot in the door. Oh, he forgot to put my name in the credits. I loved that. Oh man. So that was my first experience. It was a documentary about a, a cigar company. They're from the Dominican Republic. So I had, you know, I very quickly had to put a band together and figure out what you know, because obviously he wanted something that was going to be, you know, of that influence. Um, and it turned out to be, a, uh, except for the fact that I did, got no credit for it, I could immediately see the challenge in um, people don't ever give you any time to write. They just figured you're just going to put this together like in no time. You'll just improvise it and it's done. Um, and uh, the various challenges like, oh, I have to write in a different style. You know, just that alone is something that I've always loved, you know, mm -hmm. even as a kid. 
I would just, to me, that was just another challenge in order to learn a different kind of vocabulary, you know? And so I was just always interested in different kinds of jazz vocabulary, pop vocabulary. I was always reading the liner notes, you know, to see like, well, who, who's playing on this Steely Dan record, you know, why, mm -hmm. you know, or who's the Rhodes player on this Paul Simon record? I was just like, I gotta know because everything he's playing is so great. And, and um, this is what's so terrible about the digital age and the fact that you can't instantly get the exact same information when you mm -hmm. download something, because those are people's jobs. You know, that's how, that's a big reason why I know who those people are. And not only the engineer, not only the players, but the engineers, you know, who did the art, you know. So it's very sad that we don't have access. I mean, of course we have access, but you know what I mean? It's not yeah. built into the streaming platforms in a very thorough way, but that's, that's something else. I'm just complaining, but the real, and so the first film after that, that I did was for Jeff Garland, the comedian from, and I think one of the co-producers of Curb Your Enthusiasm, he plays Jeff, the, the, uh, the, the manager. And his kids were going to the, our kids' school. That's how I got to know Jeff. And that's how my wife got to know his, his wife. And uh, as these weird things happen, you know, people always told you, you know, you're going to get a film just by accident. You know, you're not going to, doesn't happen, but, you know, you show up, you have the meeting, you know, you know. The way it really sometimes happens is, is just through a personal connection. So what happened was we threw a party, one of the few parties we ever threw, you know, in our little house. And we just said, well, let's invite these people. It was really my wife's idea because I'm never the one who wants to come off as, as being like, you know, let's put these people together because maybe right. I'll get a job out of it. And, you know, I'm in Los Angeles and that's kind of how people think. And people expect you to think like that. People and, and well, now it's a whole other deal. Now nobody, nobody knows where the work is. So if you can connect with people, that's the way. And I actually have learned a good lesson be, uh, from that because, but that, anyway, I'm going off on tangents. <laughs> um, so make a long story, a little longer. Jeff came to the party, Jeff and Marla. Sia came, the, the singer, songwriter, who because she was a, a friend of mine at that time. She's still a friend of mine, but, um, and, but, we didn't socialize that much. She showed up. So it turned into this music soiree, something I would love to throw right now, you know, Jeez, and not, not have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that will happen. When this thing is over, man, we're going to have soirees like, uh, like you won't believe. And uh, then I'll, and I'll finally learn what that, that means in, in English. But anyway, so we had this party and it turned into this jam session. And at the party, it was like one of those classic things, you know, you know, I got, you know, and Jeff is like, you know, I got this film, it pays, you know, shit, but, you know, if you want to do it, you know, and, oh no, I know what he said. He said, do you like Nino Rota? Is what he said. And I said, yeah, I love Nino Rota. Nino Rota is the guy who wrote all the uh, Fellini movies and he did The Godfather and he did some great other scores but mostly no and we went into my little room that I had at that time that was my little music room and I in fact played him a piece called Dario and Barrio that was basically a ripoff of Nino Rota which I ended up recording and yeah I don't know mentioned a few scores that I knew anyway that was it we made a connection and uh, I ended up doing the, the, the film which was so easy in terms of it was only him that I need that I ever talked to about music nobody else had any opinion mm -hmm. so that was really cool again it was a kind of a quick turnaround it took a took a while for me to you know I just learned on the job and you get people on the phone who have who are doing it who are friends of yours and you go they sent me this do I do I chop up the the real to put it into logic or whatever, you know, or to pro, you know, and you're just figuring it out and you figure it out and boom, you've done your first film, you know, and uh, I was very happy with, you know, oh, everything I was, and I was learning how to do demos because everybody I knew was delivering demos to their producers or their directors. And so it ran into all the classic things Oh, but the but in terms of your question, you know, that was like based on a few conversations 
certainly he liked the idea of Nino Rota, but I was like, oh God, Nino Rota, that's like orchestral. You know, I can't, I'm not going to be able to, I don't want to do a, a MIDI orchestra. It's going to sound stupid. There's no money for real orchestra. So then I started researching films, Nino Rota soundtracks that were small groups, and there are a few. Mm -hmm. like where, the, where actually the organ becomes the more of the orchestral instrument. I was like, there you go. I play organ. It's perfect. And the movie was about baseball, little league baseball parents. <laughs> so the organ became a fabric. So I was like, Jeff, what if the organ is part of the soundtrack? Because it's a, he's like, great idea. And he's just, you know, anything that I brought up, he was like, I love it. You know, and the only thing was, and I worked hard on the demos too, to make them realistic. I bought this expensive trumpet library and you know, so. And he was loving the demos. And then I explained to him like, okay, so, hey, if you wanna to come to the studio on February, whatever, we're gonna, I'm gonna record all the music with the real guys. He's like, yeah, but it's not, it's not gonna be different, is it? You know, he was, it's what they call in the business, uh, demo love. But demo love is what happens to a lot of people. They get used to what they like, what they've been liking through the whole process. And then they tell them, yeah, we're going to replace all this with real people. And I said, it's going to be better. It's going to be even better. And that's what happened. He was like, yes. Yeah, and actually what I did is I, because I was nervous about it, all my organ parts were in logic and I made those sound as good as possible. I figured, you know what? I'm going to leave those. Mm -hmm. So I printed those. And when I did the session at a really in a professional studio we just played along with what i had done to and everything was to a click therefore everything wasn't new mm -hmm. and also it took the pressure off me because i've seen people at on film dates <laughs> who are playing too and i'm just like yeah maybe if i don't have to play that much i can just sort of produce you know yeah. so that was you know and it just it really felt like learning there was no music supervisor there was no was well, certainly no music supervisor there was no music editor is what I meant to say. And the music editor is, if you don't know, is someone who plays a large role in, in a film. They're the person who's sort of your, um, your, your middle person between the director in the case of film and the producers in the case of television, which is what I've learned. I didn't ever even meet a director in when I did this um, Netflix thing, which I'll tell you about. Um, it was all about the producers. Um, so he's a guy who's been to a ton of these meetings where you're, they're called spotting sessions, mm -hmm. where you, the direct, the directors are there, the producers are there, there might be a lot of people there who have, who have opinions about where there should be music. So they're looking at a current edit and, um, and I'm learning all this stuff. I mean, I've played on film, so I've been, I've been at sessions where you see this is going on or, you, or you're at somebody's home studio where most people are scoring television in their homes now. I and mean, if you're a keyboard player, I, th I, th I think that keyboard players are very, very lucky because they have all the samples and then they don't have to hire any real musicians. Um, I'm saying this facetiously, it's terrible for, mm -hmm. for, um, for musicians. But if you have no time and a sh crappy budget, that's what happens. And that's why you hear so much really bad music on television now. Think about Columbo. Have you ever watched Columbo? No. Go back to Columbo. Have you ever heard of Columbo, Camilla? I've heard of maybe. Okay, because I know you're young. You're, you're not bald like he was. No, no, Columbo wasn't bald. You're a woman. You can't, you can't tell a woman that they're not bald, even <laughs> if they're not bald. It's an old saying. But, um, and you never will. You don't, you, there's no way you're going to, look at all that hair. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to go bald. No, it's all good. Um, what I'm saying is Columbo hired an orchestra every week, every week. And the writers were really good and it was dissonant and it was doing, it was like they were using Moog synthesizers with the orchestra. And it was like, they're doing this every week. Some, some studio they're getting together and they're, and guess what? They're doing that for only two shows now, the Simpsons and family guy, I think is the only two shows in production where any anything like an orchestra or a big band, or in the case of Family Guy, both. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at a Christmas party, I'm not trying to drop names, but this is an interesting uh, party, uh, interesting uh, story, with that uh, Seth McFarlane. 
said, who was a huge music fan, is a decent singer. He said that he that they came to him and said, look, everything's great for uh, your next contract. We just need to, you know, really reduce the music budget because we don't need to be doing all this. And he said, well, no, that's not going to happen. And he insisted. He said, no, we keep doing this because this is this is why it's so good, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he's someone who's powerful, who's got money, who can say that, you know, which is great. So it gave, gave me a lot of respect for that guy, I have to say. Um, so it'd be fun to be on something of that level, you know, because one of the things, one of the skills you learn is how to write quick and how to either either also have the technical skills, which you, I don't have alone. So you always have to have an assistant who's going to at least be taking care of that stuff, whether it's file management or sending off the right bounces and labeling things correctly which all you know I all I, I had to learn oh I didn't even mention the Sundance I just to just as a thing I, I, I went and twice I did this thing at the Sundance Institute for two weeks each uh, called a, a composer's lab mm. where uh, composers were like big time people would come in and work with you and it was at the the feature film one was at um uh lucas sound you know in northern california it was absolutely incredible it was like summer camp um where you're getting your butt kicked and you have to score things quickly and it was fantastic thomas newman was there all these people were there so i had that as my first real experience as to what this looks like you know and how do you even it, it went beyond musical it was like how do you even talk to a director you know what are the, how do you, you know what do directors even know about music that's the, that's one of the things you hear from all of the they say you know you have to remember like they know a lot of them know nothing about your world uh -huh. and and you know and, and that's why they made this program so that each you, you you then work with a young director for a week and you get to see because they've been in another Sundance program doing a writing program or doing a directing program. And so then you, well, in this case, a directing program. So you get to see more about their process and, and you realize they also, you know, they don't know about music. They don't know why something's good or, you know, they might think they like a certain piece of music that they really want to use in their film. And, and, uh, or, and sometimes they have wonderful instincts even mm -hmm. though they can't explain to you uh, anything about music. Right. And those are the people you want to listen to because those are, those are the people, because I'm not a director. I, I haven't been, one thing you learn is these people have been sitting with this idea for maybe a decade. Mm -hmm. Maybe they thought of it a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And then five years ago, they started getting money to make it. And you know, it's it's like crazy. So there, it's like, can you imagine like writing a, a a piece of music for ten years, you know, and like living with your 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 stuff that long before moving on to your next thing? I'd be, I'd just be like, I hate this. Yeah. <laughs> so their process is completely different. And when they come to you, music is always the last thing, mm -hmm. that they, that really. And it kind of goes. It kind of goes simultaneously when they're still editing it, editing it. So it's very hard to give them something. That's also why the music editor is there. Okay. So if something changes between the time that you've delivered your music and then they go, oh no, we got to get rid of this. These two, you know, the music editor can go in there and go, and then okay it with you. You know, we had to take a make this a two four you know or whatever to make it work and it's like yeah, it's fine you can't hear it anyway um which is the other issue <laughs> which is the other thing that you learn uh, that we learned at the sundance institute because they got the sound department one year that year involved so you see what they do mm -hmm. and uh that's, that's when i learned that the sound department sound effects department and the music department are always at odds and when you get to that mixing stage at the very end things can get really dark it's between the composer and the um and the sound effects it's like sound effects say you can't hear my uh explosion <laughs> you know and the composer's like you can't hear my sharp nine chord 
It's unbelievable. And, uh, but, you know, you've been, there's plenty of films where you're like, huh, sometimes when the music's too, either too loud or too much, mm-hmm. that really gets to me. It's like, even if the music's good, um, if they're using it as a way to cover up other, um, this is what the Netflix producers were afraid of in the beginning, uh, that uh, so I did this thing called, uh, spending a lot of time on this question. I did this Netflix special called Madam C.J. Walker. Um, and it was a period piece that took place during the ragtime era. Oh, cool. So I got the opportunity to write for uh, ensembles that were, were in scenes. I mean, actors pretending to play those. Um, and I got to do the score. They dropped in a lot of, uh, interestingly enough, uh, contemporary um, Black music, Black female artists, and which in some cases worked really well. Actually, a lot, in, in a lot of ways, it worked well. But at the time, but it was a long process. It was only four episodes. It was a mini. It's called a limited series. And there was a lot of stress. Um, but in the end, uh, I was really, really happy with it. And uh, they reached out to me about putting it out as a soundtrack. So we did that. And that's actually what I did right at the beginning of the lockdown in March um, that had come to. And I was, I was so happy to have something to work on. They just said, yeah, put it together. You know, mm-hmm. just use the cues you want to use. And I stretched out some other cues that were too small, you know, would have been better as longer cues. And uh, it was collaborative as well to a degree with my friend Abe Browns, who's a wonderful the drummer, producer, and some of the, there was, they started dropping in all these contemporary things. So by this, um, pretty soon I realized, or I suggested to them, what if some of the music was some kind of hybrid between like hip hop and sound of, of uh, 1910, 1920, um, pre-jazz. Mm-hmm. And that's what I ended up doing for a lot of the score. And that was Abe doing a lot of beautiful beat making and production and me doing the, the sounds. And we, we would drop in things that happened during the sessions for the actual jazz tunes, which were covers of older tunes that I was doing for the scenes We'd take those files and manipulate them and use them in the hip hop little transitional music. And it turned out to be a really interesting um, soundtrack, I think. Uh, One thing that my music editor was also good at was helping me psychologically. Mm -hmm. He was my therapist. He was like, no, Larry, they like you. You know, he he was like trying to convince me that I wasn't going to get fired. He said, no, no, no. I was talking to her the other day. You know, you're doing great everything's believe me i've been in enough of these meetings i know when they don't i remember when he said this i know when they don't like a composer (laughs) i think that's kind of a universal fear that every young musician or like established musician struggles with is the fear that that they're not doing well enough and i think especially coming from the strengths that people know me to have which is not which is not that you know I'm new to that. So I, you know, I myself, I'm very like, I don't know if I can do this. I've only done it twice, you know, um, maybe I got lucky, you know, and um, that's enough of the film. So those are the different kinds of, I've never, I've never written for theater really. That would be fun. Yeah. Anytime when there's a um, existing emotional thing there, that's fun. Like my friend, Bill Domain, who's one of the people that I, frequently write with as a as a lyricist we've written in all sorts of ways he's sent me some of my favorite things that we've done were lyrics that he sent to me and uh, or he sent me a pile not he emailed me a pile and uh he just said he just said if any of them these mean anything to you you know go for it and that's how a few things happened and that's a whole other angle to to take when you're writing then you really get tuned into the idea of like oh you know these notes have to mean something i have to make this word you know work Mm -hmm. you know or how can i or sometimes you get too comfortable with something because musically it is strong 
and you forget to look at look at it deeper and you look again you go yeah but couldn't i do something better because the because he's saying this and uh one just only has to look at great songs to you know figure that out but music you know non-singing people sometimes are so nerdy about just music I mean, it took me years to, as much as I was listening to music with, with singers, it took me w- years to, to tune in to lyri- the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, like Bob Dylan, for instance. I loved Bob Dylan, even though I, it, the reason why it wasn't because I was dissecting the meaning of his lyrics. I, I don't know, I loved the purity of it. I liked, I liked early Bob Dylan's voice. Um, early Bob Dylan's voice. I like Bob Dylan's early voice. I like his, I just, I like folk music. I like pure folk music, but uh, same with like Leonard Cohen. I didn't, you know, or just the fact that I love so much Brazilian music or some, some, so many of us do. I don't know what they're saying. I'm missing half the experience. And yet this music is mesmerizing, you know? Yeah. Um, so Anyway, uh, the experience, and then other times uh, I'll send him a fully written thing. Um, in the case of Sia, who we got to do some writing together, some things that have hopefully we'll see. Only oh, one thing has come out, two things. Um, there were these children's songs. This was more artistic. This, this, this was more um, Beatles-y, Brian Wilson stuff. Mm-hmm. And the writing, her lyric writing was so fast. We'd finish the basic structure, then she'd go outside and sit on this bench and just start scribbling away. And I think I've got it. You know? And oh, she was amazing. Just to see kind of talents like that. Mm-hmm. Um, also to see people who don't second guess themselves. You know, they just they have this, you know, they they have this uh, strong feeling about it. They go with it, you know, and. Um, Back to the that's film and TV thing, that's a skill you have to have. You have to work quick and, and not, not obsess. You can't, you don't have, you don't really have time to obsess. And I guess as an improviser in, in jazz, you kind of have to get in that mindset every time you play, you can't yeah. sit it on anything. Yeah, so improvisers are a natural, have a natural, and I think would have a natural st- strength in this department. The mm-hmm. only thing is whether you can turn off certain things in your brain you know i mean the biggest thing you turn off is the fact that the people watching this final product are not here to hear that they're they're not coming to for you (laughs) they're they're they're, uh in this case of a film or television show you know they're not gonna most of them are not gonna notice you were even there which which is often a good thing um i mean i mean a good thing in terms of you've done a good job. You haven't written something that's um, in the way and totally. inappropriate. Um, but the fact is music is so underappreciated and undernoticed in how effective it is. Um, this thing that I saw on YouTube, you've probably seen it where they removed John Williams music from, from a long scene, you know, in Star Wars where nothing's really happening yeah. except action and there's no music. And it's replaced with all these phony, you know, new sound effects. It's hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious because there's no music. It doesn't work. I mean, you realize how much emotion John Williams was was filling you up with mm-hmm. during those scenes. You were watching all this stuff go, but actually, you were also feeling all this stuff that he was writing. And um, anyway, that's the extreme version of it but so i do love i do love that you can manipulate in in that way and you can Uh see and you can but you can't uh sometimes jazz musicians have trouble uh i did because it takes uh, it takes humility i mean it's you're not there to play the hippest stuff that you know Uh Uh, you're you're there to uh serve a purpose and to um if you have you if you can uh sneak it in which i tried to do in this madam cj walker and in the other one if you can sneak in some of yourself great you yeah know. i wanted to maybe a final question or if anyone has a couple more afterwards um but any advice you have for young musicians about developing your voice your sound like how 
to take everything you learn and then at the end of the day how do you be how do you become you as a musician do you have advice about that um well good man i just had to sneak in a little snack there and <laughs> and it's peanuts and i'm allergic so in a couple minutes <laughs> the paramedics will be here so let's get this done um so well I think the main thing is to not be limited to a um, listening and studying your your main instrument. You should be just as immersed in it. Like, for instance, if you're transcribing things like that, mm -hmm. um, um, don't. If you're a guitar player, don't listen to guitar players. <laughs> Please, whatever you do, no, just you know, listen to horn players, listen to singers, listen to you know. Um, non uh, vocal using uh, players are I think best when they're able to transcend the fact that they don't have that they, when they're able to get that kind of feeling out of their instrument that they're mm -hmm. breathing you know piano players and guitar players have this problem that they don't stop playing you know because they don't have to right um, but that's not actual I think for music so expose yourself to all every kind of music that um if you're not aware that you know uh that, that there's classical music out there that um i mean look when herbie hancock says that ravel is his biggest influence you know or whatever it was he said you know to something to that you know it's like okay i i need to be i need to be figuring out why mm -hmm. you know what's going on here um so but i naturally always any, anybody who's you know there are many people like me in that way who just gravitate to something that's harmonically new to them you just got to keep looking and looking and looking and be being analytical mm -hmm. um i think it's important to know how to read music but not necessary but these days i would just say the more skills you have you know, more skill sets you have the better um because things are so you know insecure in our in our business so if you can uh for instance i really wish that i were a great reader um i would love the challenge and the experience of um i think and the money because I think the money is quite good, of being one of the two or three people in Los Angeles, for instance, who uh, play all the films, you know, mm -hmm. that come through uh, the sound stations with all the composers and, and boom, they've never seen the music and here we go and boom. I've been to some of these sessions and I just go, sorry, <laughs> take care. All right, good. Not for me. Yeah. And but I wish it was for me because the same skill would enable me to just open up a Brahms intermezzo and just enjoy it. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, and of course I could be doing that, but it's not enjoyable because it's too slow. It's too it's too difficult. Right. Um, you'd think during a pandemic that would be one of the things that I try to check off, but <laughs> um, but you know. Actually, I've been taking mandolin lessons and oh, nice. also a chromatic harmonica. So it's not like I've just been doing nothing. <laughs> um, so I would say, and uh, look, you know, that's my sons, but, you know, to just sit down at the drums, you know, as a non drummer is so important. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those films with Chick Corea? He could play the drums. Now, he had some of the greatest rhythm and rhythmic, rhythmic concepts as a piano player. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I would say um, that there's so many directions now. I mean, just, just, just using sound, you know, and samples. Uh, if, you, if, you have a, if you're a musical person, uh, for instance, not only do you not know, really know how, need, need to know how to play an instrument uh, or read, but you don't, know, you don't need to really play an instrument. You can be a guy with pads, you know, and and do some really, really amazing things, you know? And that's the thing that I've seen from younger people and from people just who have different skill sets like in the film world or the way they approach writing, you know? 
they're not people who are players first necessarily. A few of them are, mm -hmm. uh, but they're conceptual. You know, conceptually, they're really got something. You know, so don't be a, a snob. Uh, always realize you can learn from somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't play an instrument, <laughs> but somehow puts together incredible songs or scores or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And and because uh, I was a big jazz snob, and jazz musicians can be snobs. You know, I was real. You know, I was a jazz police kind of guy. Where like, you know, it was bebop, and you know, and. And then I and then I, at a certain point I realized, well, what was I listening to before jazz? I was into all this other stuff. I like every kind of music, so I'm not that person anymore. Um, but I was very snobby about like the types of skills that you must have, you know, to be great, you know. And actually, no, people come come at this from all different ways, you know. They're no wor they're no less great just because they can't tell you that that's a D minor eleven, you right. Know? Right. Um, there are times when I wish I wasn't thinking in those terms. Mm -hmm. wish I, was, I was just thinking in terms of like colors or something, or something, you know? Well, this has been such an amazing conversation, Larry. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, ah, it's my pleasure. Do you have any final thoughts or if there's any last minute questions out there? Um, the question I have for you is uh, who are you listening to today? I really like this guy, Blake Mills. I always bring him up, who's become a friend of mine. And he's actually, first time I met him, he was just a uh, punk at Malibu High. And I came to do a master class and he was the guitar player. He's now a really big producer, but he's an excellent uh, musician, just all around musician, excellent guitar player. And again, like what I was saying before, a conceptual kind of person in terms of how he thinks about making records and the orchestration and how he's um, thinking in terms of color. And also this new one, which there was only two singles. He's releasing one every couple of weeks or something. It's a record that I was involved in actually. It's Pino Palladino's record. It's Pino and Blake. It's there and I'm on some of it and wrote something for it as well. But Blake is great. Um, in the jazz world, I'm always curious about um, what Cecile, and uh, Sullivan are doing. I saw one a very inspiring thing during it was several months ago, but it was like a oh, I got must have not been live, but I had just happened upon it. It was one of those tiny desk concerts or something, and I was very very impressed with um, that level of uh, musicianship there. Um, I love this gospel organ player that I that you can find on YouTube, and he's very inspiring. His name he's probably my favorite. Con current gospel organ player and his name is Derek Jackson. I highly recommend you go look at his videos, particularly for keyboard players. There's a few that are like master classes, <laughs> except, you know, his idea of teaching is like, well, I don't know if you get to the F shop and you just want that kind of feeling of, you know, and, that, and then you just go there and that's how it's done. <laughs> You're like, yeah, you know, and, and he doesn't explain it, but you watch <laughs> him do it. And, oh, I, I learned something just the other day by how he's doing some inner movement stuff. Um, there's people I keep going back to, I, you know, like Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday from the 30s. That's just my perfect dinner music. And um, who else? Oh, this is a book that I recommend that's about music. It's, it's uh, written by a composer, Max Rieger. It's called Modulation. And it's li really thin. And all it is, you can find it on Amazon, it's like $7, $7. All it is is like start in this key and then eight chords later end up in this key. And it's all like in Bach kind of four, four part style writing. And it's really fun. It's really good. Um, those are a few, but I'm always listening to music and that's what I would also recommend to to people um and and then i'll just leave you with this what paul blaze paul blaze advice to me which applies to that question camilla is uh after he heard me for the first time which was at the village gate i recognized him and i got up after the set and he came up to me and 
he said, this is literally what he said. There was no introduction. He said, I know what you need to do. You need to gather up all your favorite records and throw them out the window. <laughs> that's, that's maybe what people should do. Not, you know, only after they've internalized them, mm -hmm. you know, gotten enough from them that they, they've learned, they, they feel like they've learned what there is to learn from it. Mm -hmm. Then throw them out the window. <laughs> And, you know, that was amazing advice because, I mean, at the time I might have been a little offended, I think. Um, but no, I wasn't really. But I knew what he meant. He meant, I, I hear your influences and I don't want to. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I want to hear something else. And that was probably one of the best things anybody's ever said to me, particularly because it was somebody like that who I did look up to. And we ended up going out to coffee and he said some weird things. But, <laughs> man, I'll never ever forget that experience yeah wow you know and just the fact that i've had experiences where either i'm told something by a jim hall or i'm told a story that comes secondhand from charlie parker right. you know any chance that people have to spend time with people who have experience you know because unfortunately you know those people you know, the Tommy Flanagan's, you know, the people that I was able to go hear any night of the week in New York, you know, of that generation, they're gone, basically, or they're not playing or, or and, you know, so we're getting further and further away from the source. So, um, and there's no, there's no way of, there's no uh, substitute for that. So people should get to the source, whatever that means to them, if they, mm -hmm idolize a person they know they're now we're in a pandemic but when people start playing gigs again and it's you know people feel like they need to go to new york or to wherever it is they need to really absorb stuff unfortunately this is the worst time for someone who wants to learn music There's, yeah you know bands that are doing virtual rehearsals or whatever they've i'm sure very brilliantly people have have, have come up with ways to but they're not playing together sucks <laughs> that's the whole point yeah. so well thank you larry i really Great. appreciate you taking the time okay well